Well, greetings, brother and sister in Christ. What a joy to be able to connect with you today as we meet around God's Word. Last week, we started off speaking about the importance of reducing in certain areas. The word is shrink, the blessing of shrinkage. And I spoke about how people are more inclined to accept the word and the blessing of increase in their life, but to shun the, the, the blessing of decrease or shrinking in their life. But the blessing of increase can be just as destructive if it's not applied properly. We spoke about that and we spoke about the importance of closing certain channels in our life as well. I'm not going to repeat the whole message. Go and check out the first part. Please actually check out the first part before we carry on here in this part today. So today I'm going to pick up right where we left off last week. You remember last week I came in agreement right towards the end as we agreed with the Lord to close certain channels in your life because there are certain channels that allow guilt into your life from the path that you used to walk when you were still in the land of slavery. I just want to pick up where I left off there and I want to just exhort you and I want to encourage you. If you've been suffering from a condemning inner dialogue in your heart, if, if there has been a voice that has persistently sought to drag you down or condemn you, I am yet to confirm to you that that inner dialogue, that voice is not the voice of God. Now, now you may ha have been a terrible person before you came to know the Lord your Savior uh, the Lord Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. But that's the power of salvation. No matter how terrible you were before, God hasn't come just to remold you. The Bible says that in Christ Jesus, you're a brand new creation. In fact, let me quote from Scripture. Paul actually writes this to the Corinthian church. He says, if anyone, that's you, that's me, is in Christ Jesus, he is a brand new creation. Listen to what it says. The old doesn't say is going to go. It says the old has passed away. And behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So what's the problem? I'll tell you what the problem is. Look at that word. It says, behold, the new has has come. Do you know what that word behold implies? It implies you need to see it. We're getting back to the concept of vision again. The problem is, is that although some people are brand new creatures in Christ Jesus, they have not had a revelation of it. They don't see it because they've not had a vision of it. This morning, brother, this morning, sister, I'm inviting you to get a vision that you're not the old person that you were. When you got up to all those horrible, sinful acts, you're a brand new creation. You are holy. You are pure in Christ Jesus. And yes, there's some areas that need to be worked on. That's part of the sanctification process. And just as the devil was so busy and working in your life before, listen, the workman in your life has changed. The workman in your life is no longer the devil. Now, the workman in your life is Jesus Christ. You just keep on the path long enough and you see the beauty that Jesus is about to form in you. You see the beauty that Jesus is about to perform, the holiness, that wonderful work, as His work in your life conforms you more and more to His beautiful image. Yes, my word. Behold. See it. It's not that it hasn't happened. It has happened. The moment you gave your heart to Jesus, it happened. But now the new has come. So behold it. See it. See the vision. Get the vision. You are a brand new creature in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Right? So I just want to encourage you for those, with those wonderful words. God is not condemning you. Paul says in Romans 8 verse 1, it says, There is therefore now... Now look at that word now. Now it says there's no condemnation. So perhaps there used to be condemnation before. Oh yes, before you came to know Jesus, you were not a child of God. You were an enemy of God. You were not under His divine favor. You were under His wrath. 
but thanks be to Jesus Christ that you're not in that land anymore of slavery. You're now in your promised land with God. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you and me, we're in Christ Jesus. That means that there's no condemnation. Why do you condemn yourself if God himself is not condemning you? No, you're a brand new creation and your feet are planted firmly in a brand new land. The original w Greek word for no is strongly emphatic. If I could, if I could be a little bit of a, a dramatist here, let, let, let's put it this way. The, the emphatic Greek word, there is now no, there is now no condemnation. That's what the Bible is trying to say. That's what they agree. No condemnation for those who are in Greek. Oh, oh, who are in Christ. Oh, what a wonderful language that Greek is when it comes to tell us those things. How then do you close these doors, these conduits to your past? I spoke a little bit about that before, but I'm, I'm going to just add a little bit to that now. You systematically, doesn't all happen at once, right? But you systematically close these channels on guilt and on condemnation and on the corruption that there is when you meditate on the truth of the biblical doctrine of God's immeasurably deep fatherly love for you immeasurably that doesn't mean because you can't measure it that you can't look at it that you can't behold it it's like the ocean you can't measure the ocean not in yourself but I tell you what, you can stand and you can meditate upon it. You can enjoy its beauty. You can enjoy, enjoy its rhythms. Uh, you can still look upon it. You need to gaze upon God's deep, immeasurably deep love for you. You will not want to fall back into any of the old habits of the old man when you were in the old land of slavery. When you get a revelation of how deeply God loves you. He loves you, man. And you certainly won't depreciate your own worth when you get a revelation of how deeply God loves you and how very precious you are in His sight. So yes, the Bible does also teach us that our Heavenly Father is very, very strict with us. But He's only strict in so far as He wants the very best for us. God will discipline you and He will correct you and he will convict you in order to keep you on that path that's going to lead you to your greatest fulfillment. Jesus speaks of the abundant life. So God will di direct and convict and correct you to keep you, leading you to that place of your abundance that Jesus speaks about. To that place where you will most glorify him in the way that you live and conduct, conduct yourself as well. Yes, God's very good at keeping us on those paths. But God, listen to me, although he will correct you, he will never condemn you. Have you ever thought about what condemnation is? Have you ever stopped to just say, oh, okay, what, is, what does the Bible mean when it speaks about condemnation? Yes, there's different meanings. But I believe that what Paul is speaking about in Romans chapter 8, it's not just about carrying guilt. Condemnation happens once the trial is over. Once your guilt has been firmly established, that's when condemnation happens. Uh, once it's been established beyond any doubt. Con condemnation is the result of a guilty verdict. Condemnation is a death penalty. Listen, and when we're speaking in the arena of, of spiritual things, I'm not just speaking about uh, mortal death. I I'm speaking about spiritual, eternal death irrevocable death I, I, I repeat though God will never condemn those who are in Christ never like the Bible says never no never no never will God condemn those who are in Christ so if you're in Christ Jesus oh boy you're in a good place in his hand and the more that I think on these things the more that I'm convinced that the growth and the abundance in some areas of our lives is directly related to our being reduced in other areas and to our shrinking in other areas in our life. Let's put it differently. We will never grow in some areas unless we shrink in others. And this being the case, you would do well to bear in mind that whenever you ask God 
to bring increase into your life in one area. By default, you are often also asking Him to bring decrease into some other areas of your life. Doesn't that just make sense? Right? So this is not always a bad thing. Shrinking is not always a bad thing, nor is it a need for concern. I, I can't understand why so many of us get perplexed at the prospect of God pruning us. Any gardener will tell you that a good prune is necessary for good growth. When, when you're being pruned, just remember who is holding the shears. Does the Bible not tell us no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly in Psalm 84 verse 11. No good thing. So listen, when God is busy pruning you, he says, write this. No, that's good. I'm going to leave that. I won't be pruning that. Okay, this, all right. It may be, it may be right now that right now it seems like it's good for them, but that is going to rob them of great later. Snip and off it goes. God's very good. Never be afraid of God depriving you of anything that is good. God would never do that. Never, no, never, no, never. I, I have found that God will only remove things from our lives. He will only prune something from our lives for one of three or perhaps a combination of one of these three primary reasons. Either because it is outright bad for us or sinful. Uh, maybe it is preventing the very best for us right so good will always rob you of great right sometimes we compromise with good and God says no no there's more for you or perhaps because he is taking that thing for now and putting it in safe keeping for us so so if it seems like God has taken something good you've got to trust him it says he will never withhold it he may just keep it and reserve it for now in safe keeping but you will be reconciled to that. Any, any of these reasons should be a source of great comfort for us. And, and this is why I have learned to rejoice just as much in the doors that God closes as those doors that I would have Him open for me. God has got no problem with operating in the opposing principles of opening and closing, the opposing principles of increase and shrinking, or perhaps binding and loosing because God knows how essential the one principle is to the other so in returning to our opening remarks that we made remember when when I said uh, last week what happens when it feels like we're not walking in favor what happens when it feels like we're not got the divine uh, esteem or the divine anointing upon us let's return to those remarks and let's make a few observations now in that context when you get to understand and not just understand but also to embrace the amazing power of the principle of oppositions or opposing principles the next time that you go through any period of shrinking you are going to start rejoicing like you're a sweepstakes winner why because you know that any lack that you experience in one area is evidence that something amazing is on its way in another area. You will also know that what has been removed from you is either being kept in safe keeping or it's been bad for you or it's been preventing the very best for you. So, you can rejoice. You will also know that what is about to be released over you is straight from the very hand of God. And that all that the Lord gives is very, very, very good. The Apostle James tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights. James 1 and verse 17. There were a group of saints in the fifth chapter of the book of Romans who not only learned to rejoice in shrinking, they even rejoiced in suffering. This is not because they enjoyed suffering in and of itself, but because they knew that their suffering was the vehicle that would courier the priceless gifts of endurance and character and hope straight to them. How will the enemy ever discourage you if you have a mindset like this? How will he ever get on top of you if you realize that no matter what the Lord allows into your life, ultimately 
it's going to end in good. You may be crying tears now, but I tell you what, joy comes in the morning. You may be going through shrinkage now, but you don't see it as loss. You see it as pruning. You see it as making room for something amazing that God is getting ready to do in your life. No matter what comes your way, you know that everything is going to work towards your good. No matter how dark the path may seem, you know that your great high shepherd is busy leading you. No matter how fierce your enemies may seem, you know that the captain of the heavenly armies has got your back. No matter how severe that famine may rage, you know that God is your provider. Wow! Nothing can get a person with a mindset like that down. The enemy will throw at you what he can. But you know that your God is far more powerful than your enemy. And no matter what the enemy throws at you, you know that ultimately it's not the enemy that can take from you. No, no, no. God allows your pruning. The same God who gives your increase is the same God that will at times reduce and bring decrease. But he's got a very good reason for bringing that into your life. When you go through those times when it seems like everything is conspiring against you, uh, when you go through those times uh, when it seems like everything, no matter how hard you try, every time it seems like those doors are closing, listen to me. Always remember that you are still highly favored by our Almighty God. When your esteem has been shattered by the rejection of others, or perhaps by the great achievement of others, know that your heavenly father esteems you highly and that he is directing your paths to your purpose when you endure financial difficulty know that your provider is not subject to the economy he is not subject to lack or to bankruptcy know too that there are many many times that we will endure these difficulties not because of god's wrath but rather because of his favor these are not signs of God's anger or disappointment with you, but of his affirmation of your being his child. If you endure a season of one obstacle after another, know that the opposite season of smooth sailing is on its way. If you endure a season of low self-esteem, know that the opposite season of great honor is on its way. If you endure a season of financial difficulty, know that the opposite season of great financial blessing is on its way. However, you must first endure the suffering. And let me counsel you, endure these sufferings with rejoicing because you know that suffering is a proclamation that the opposite is on its way. Jesus made an amazing statement in the 10th verse of the 16th chapter of the book of Luke. There he said, One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. Now, maybe you have gone through a time of shrinking because you have been too big in an area to prove faithful in that area have you ever thought about that you have gone through a time of shrinking or reduction in an area because you've been too big in that area what happens if a, as a businessman that's your gifting man what happens if your business closes perhaps you've been too big in that area to prove faithful in that area I, I think now of a time I often share with people there was once a businessman who stood up in a congregation amongst the people and his heart was sincere god bless him but he stood up in the congregation and he was just trying to motivate his brothers and sisters to be faithful too and he said you know brothers i remember before i became a wealthy businessman i sat in these pews here amongst you and the lord put on my heart to come and to tithe my last ten dollars to come and tithe he said, well, I wrestled with the Lord, but you know, I came and I tithed my very last money. I came and I tithed that money and look how God has blessed me now with much. Well, it sounds very good, but there was a little old lady who stood up in the group and she put her hand up and he said, yes, my dear. She said, you know, that's just such an encouraging word, how you were faithful with the little, but I, t I come and I challenge you now, do it again give your very last cent 
to God. Well, I don't know what the outcome of that story was, but boy, would that church have been blessed if that businessman was just as faithful in the much as what he was in the little. Do you remember how God had to reduce Gideon's army? Go, go and read about that in the seventh chapter of the book of Judges. Here's the condensed version. Gideon raised an army to face the, invades, the invading Midianite forces. The Midianites kept coming over the border of Israel and well Gideon said he had had enough and as a judge he had now come and he had raised an army to go and meet with those Midianites. And it was a formidable army, thousands of men that Gideon had raised. And I'm sure that Gideon felt quite secure in his numbers. But then God intervened. God knew all well that if Gideon's great army won the battle, then Gideon and the Israelites would from that time on put their trust in their army and put their trust in their numbers. God never wants us to put our trust in an army. Never wants us to put our trust in our number. If you've gone through reduction, perhaps you've put a, a, a trust in that area and God said, whoa, there'll only be one God in your life. God was having none of that. So God reduced the army to just 300 men. There were thousands he let go. He said, take them home, man. If they're fearful, take them home. He let them go. He reduced that army to just 300 men. And with that army of just 300 men, God gave Gideon the victory. God has allowed you to be reduced so that there can be no doubt as to who is on your side. Have you ever thought about it that way? God doesn't want there to be any doubt. He doesn't want the glory to go to some rich benefactor. He doesn't want the glory to go to some powerful colleague. No. God wants people to know and to understand that He is your help. And people must get that. They, they must know that God's hand is upon your life. More importantly, you will forever be assured that nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. 1 Samuel 14 verse 6. So don't look around at your circumstances. Don't look around at the result of shrinkage in your life. You say, well, Lord, maybe you've gone a little bit crazy with those pruning shares. You've cut too much out. Listen, the Lord can save whether by many or whether by few. You just be faithful and the Lord will save. You be faithful and the Lord will provide. There will be times that Jesus is going to shrink you. And he's going to shrink your abilities. He's going to shrink your esteem. He's going to shrink your connections. He's going to shrink your finances or anything else that you may have invested your trust in so that you can prove faithful with the very little that is left. Notice that Jesus didn't say, one who is faithful in much will also be faithful in little. No, it was the other way around. I've known very many people who have seemed to have been faithful while they've had much. Oh boy, you can quote the scriptures, you can rejoice and do the dancing while there's much, but their faithfulness was a farce. And I know that their faithfulness was a farce, because when their much was taken away, their faith crumbled. However, the Apostle Paul wrote of how to be faithful in certain circumstances. The Apostle Paul wrote of this matter in Philippians 4 verse 11. And he said he knows how to be faithful no matter what the circumstances, whether there's lack or whether there's plenty. Here's the bottom line. You are only a faithful steward insofar as what you are stewarding is taken from you and reduced. Your, your faith remains firm. Your faith will remain firm because you will have learnt from your heavenly father that he will never withhold anything good from you. Let's be honest now. If you had already mastered that lesson, then we would not be having this conversation right now. The process of shrinking in any area of your life is evidence that God is preparing you to steward much. Did you get what I just said? Don't just look on things growing smaller. Look on that shrinking process as evidence that God is getting you ready to steward much. Do you remember the principle of oppositions here? Yeah. My heart breaks.
for those who give up when they reduced do they not see that their shrinking is a great honor do, do they not see that it is evidence that they have qualified for the test to steward very much you've qualified for the test now pass the test so, so what if this qualification has required their worldly wealth so what as it is written what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his very soul Matthew 16 26 be quick be joyous to surrender anything that may be required of you because you are being evaluated to see if you have what it takes to steward true riches those true riches spoken of in Luke 16 and verse 11 true riches so what if worldly wealth has been shrunk true wealth eternal wealth is on its way so you may not be able to walk into the grandest boutique and get outfitted with the most luxurious of fabrics but guess what you have access to the throne room of heaven because you're clothed in Christ's garments of righteousness can you be a faithful steward of such wealth so you may not be able to afford the top-notch VIP medical aid membership but guess what you can lay your hands on the ill and declare in the name of Jesus be healed can you be a faithful steward of such wealth you may not be able to afford the, the, the most luxurious of cars but you have another mode of transport because the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes so it is with everyone who is born of the spirit John 3 verse 8 so you may not have the most luxurious of cars but you've got the wind of the spirit and let me tell you if God needs you to be anywhere he will get you there can you be a faithful steward of such wealth you may not be able to live in the most opulent of houses but Jesus has promised in my father's house are many rooms if it were not so would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you John 14 verse 2 can you be a faithful steward of such wealth so your closest friends even your family may have abandoned you but Jesus has promised he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him can you be a faithful steward of such wealth the wealth of Jesus himself manifesting himself to you in whatever form he chooses see the list is endless I could I could go on and on ad infinitum but let me summarize stop being grieved by the lacks that you suppose yourself to have suffered stop being grieved stop walking around and sulking by the things that God has taken out of your life what you're going through is not about lack it's about your being prepared to steward what really matters here's my advice to you my, 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 my brotherly advice here, here, here is my deeply affectionate sincerely loving advice to you get a grip on the big picture if God is truly as powerful as wise and as loving as the Bible teaches us that he is th th then why is it that he has allowed this reduction why is it that he has allowed this shrinking into your life I will answer the question it is because he has got more in store for you oh so much more in store for you than you could possibly imagine so much more and not just the temporary worldly kind of misty stuff that is yet today and gone tomorrow no no your father has got the kind of stuff in store for you that heaven considers true treasure uh, that which is truly valuable and eternally viable your father has in mind for you that which is required to make you more like the darling of heaven our Lord Jesus Christ God doesn't just want to reduce you because he wants less of you no he reduces those things in you that hinder you from becoming more like Jesus Christ 
John the Baptist said it best when he said, He must increase, but I must decrease. John 3 and verse 30. Never fret, my dear brother. Never fret, my dear sister, when you see any area in your life decrease. Remember, God is the governor of all that happens in your life. Even the decreases. Even the shrinking. Isn't any decrease that you may suffer, no matter how painful it may seem at the time, isn't it insignificant when compared to the outcome of that suffering? Oh dear disciple, I want to counsel you. Embrace all that the Lord ordains for you. Even the sufferings, even the decreases. Trust in the mastery of our Lord as He leads. And when He requires it of you, joyfully, faithfully, without reservation, shrink. This light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. Let's come together and allow me to pray for you and speak a blessing upon you. O oh, my Heavenly Father, as we consider all these things, Lord, we are but clay. We get them today and forget them tomorrow. But I want to pray, Lord, for my dear brother or sister that is watching now. Lord, would you give them the grace to shrink? Would you give them the grace, Lord God, to accept gracefully and to embrace joyfully any area in their life that you wish to apply the pruning shears? O oh Lord, because you are good. And O oh Lord, that you will never withhold anything good. And O oh God, because you are so wise. You are busy shaping us and conforming us into that wonderful image of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Would you stir up within them, not a heart that is grieved because of the lack that they have suffered, but Lord, a heart that is joyful for anything that you have taken out of their lives. Because God, you don't just take away but you bring as well. And you're not just cutting for the sake of cutting, but Lord, you are making room for great increase, for great expanse, for great increase in, in, in every area that would bring to us and conform us to be more like Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Oh God, you are the governor of our increase. And oh Lord, we trust you even with the decrease. Now as I dismiss my brothers and sisters, I do so in that name which is above every other name, the name of the darling of heaven, the name in which we all trust, Jesus our sovereign Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. And now may you go and may you walk in that name as he blesses you and keeps you. Bye-bye.